Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Several faculty members from the University of Michigan undertook a study to look at the meaning and function of work. They wondered if the whole attitude toward work had changed in our industrialized and now service-oriented society. What they discovered, among other things, is that really there was really very little difference in the various stratas of income about people's attitudes toward work. There was really very little difference between blue-collar and white-collar workers and their attitude toward work. What they discovered was, among other things, certainly there was a, a significant group of people who simply looked at work as an economic issue. I have to pay the bills. We have to have food on the table for the family, and so I have to go to work. And that was their attitude, their perspective of work. However, they also found a larger group of people, again, in all stratas of society, who had a nobler view of work. They looked at work and said, well, work provides meaning for life. Work provides a purpose for life. Or work connects me to the, the greater amount of society around me. And while we certainly applaud that higher view of work, could that still result in emptiness? Could that still result in something less than fulfillment and satisfaction? Is there a, still a higher view of work than that yet? It's an ongoing struggle with people. Front page of the business section of today's Journal Sentinel. As an article about it, they, while not referring to the study, basically state in various ways some of the very things that that study discovered. So it's, it's relevant for us. The teacher, most people believe that that was Solomon who is now close to the end of his life, is writing in Ecclesiastes about many aspects of life. The particular one that we are looking at today is the meaning of work and what he has discovered about it. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, directed by God, he wants to warn other people because he sees other people who are falling into the same trap that he fell into for a period of his life. He's trying to warn them so that they could have a different perspective on the meaning of work. In that short, short section of our text, the teacher uses the phrase, under the sun, three times. The book of Ecclesiastes isn't all that long, but it's used 29 times in that book. So obviously, that's a pretty important concept that he is using to communicate with people. But what does he mean with that term, under the sun? What he means is a viewpoint, a, a perspective that centers on the here and the now and the present of this earth. It doesn't take into account because it's limited to something so small like our solar system. And a perspective on life and specifically in our text, a perspective on work. But there's a much greater perspective of the entire universe. And there's still even a greater perspective than that from the eternal God. 
But he has lived a portion of his life with a perspective, with an understanding, with a mindset of simply working because of the here and the now. And it has led at a certain point in his life to a deep sense of emptiness. He says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. And then he must leave all he owns to someone who's not worked for it. Unbelievers or people that are weak in the Christian faith and operate with the perspective of under the sun can have knowledge, wisdom, and skill. They can have a knowledge that they have learned, that they've accumulated, that they've investigated about a certain aspect or portion of life or the workings in this world. They can have a wisdom to be able to take that knowledge and apply it to specific situations and then the skill to be able to take all of that and to have it be working perhaps even on a broader scale. We can think of dozens of people who have had knowledge from that. They have used their wisdom and applied that in a skillful way, and they have been tremendously successful in what they have done throughout the ages. Perhaps a little bit closer to our economic situations. We can also think of people in a specific aspect have accumulated knowledge and a wisdom to be able to use that knowledge and a skill, whether those are people skills or organizational skills or system skills, but skills that they've used and they have been able to do some things. Somebody may be a, a master carpenter and can take the pieces of wood and make it into beautiful furniture. Somebody may be able to design a house and then have the wisdom to be able to organize things so it can be built and the skills to be able to utilize that on a broader scale and, and have a small company. We see it all around us, don't we? People who have knowledge a skill, a wisdom to be able to use that knowledge in specific aspects and maybe in large or smaller areas, and then a skill to multiply it and carry it out. Solomon was somebody like that. Solomon had done by God's wisdom that he got imparted to him, and skills had done massive building projects throughout Israel more than just the temple and the palace he lived in. There were aqueducts that were being built and other kinds of public projects that he was designing and carrying out. He had the knowledge and the wisdom and the skill to develop policies for economic situations, trade situations that brought about and resulted in prosperity in Israel. He had the knowledge and the wisdom and the skill to be able to look at his country and say, we need to strengthen a defensive system here and here for uh, possible attacks in the future. And he undertook those projects and carried them out. He was blessed with knowledge and wisdom and skill in his administration as the wise king of Israel. But now he's at the end of his life or closer to the end of his life. And he says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to someone who comes after me. He had seen it happen so often. Somebody had used their knowledge, wisdom, skill. They had worked hard. They had toiled. They had thought about late at night things that were going on and things that needed to be done. And they continued to work at it. And then the next person came along and took over and squandered it. 
or didn't have the skills, didn't invest the time and effort needed to acquire the knowledge, the discipline for learning the wisdom. And whether it happened abruptly or oh so gradually, it began to disintegrate. He had seen it happen in so many levels in society. And he realized, <laughs> same thing can happen to me. And the next king. So what's the point of working hard and toiling at something if it may just all end up with nothing? Do you wonder how the people who worked at AC Delco feel? A plant that was massive. A plant that was on the, the cutting edge and involved in space exploration, an aspect of it. I'm told that some of the smartest minds in the world were coming to Oak Creek because of that plant. And that's no longer there. Or some of you or know people who spent years working at building the first expressways here in Milwaukee. Now they're being torn down. It's like those people that were involved in those industries and works, and there are all kinds of other ones around, aren't there? And the evidence of their work, the evidence of their life, of activity, it's being erased right before their eyes. So what was the purpose of it all? What good did it do? You see, that's what Solomon is struggling with. He says his heart is in despair. Because as he looks to the future, he realizes all of this can fall apart so quickly. And what was the point of it all then? In the Concordia Self-Study Bible, in the introduction to the book of Ecclesiastes, the editor writes, as the author looks about at human experience, enterprise, he sees mankind in mad pursuit of one thing and then another, laboring as if they could master the world, lay bare its secrets, change its fundamental structures, break through the bounds of human limitations, and master his own destiny. He sees man vainly pursuing hopes and expectations that in reality are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Those are sobering words, aren't they? Some of this ringing a little true in your ears for you? And repent of your perspective. It's rebellion against God. It's a perspective that is not taking him into account. It will end in emptiness because it's too shallow, too limiting. Solomon had learned there's a far greater view, far more expansive, that in Christ and his forgiveness, the believer in Jesus can have about the meaning of work. He says in the second paragraph, A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat and find enjoyment? He sees work now as from the hand of God. It's not something 
so small a place as under the sun. It is from the hand of God that he can carry out and he can do in service and praise and thanks to that God. Now there's a different perspective on work, isn't there? A perspective that lifts it from the here and the now and the resulting emptiness that can be there and lifting it to a purpose and service to the Lord. Have some of you seen the bumper sticker? I owe, I owe. So off to work I go. That person is saying their philosophy of life. Their perspective is that work is purely an economic situation. I got to pay the bills, so I got to go to work. Boy, their work has got to be dull and boring. <laughs> I bet they can't wait for the, the end of the day and the end of the week. And the great day is coming that I can retire and I don't have to go to work anymore. What a sad perspective. But it comes from under the sun. And there are others with a no, more noble view. And they can have a sense of fulfillment and satisfaction and meaning and purpose in life. But at the end of the day, it can still result in an emptiness. And then there's the Christian that can view work as from the hand of God and done in service to him. When God created in perfection Adam and placed him in the Garden of Eden, he gave him work to do. Granted, there weren't any weeds, <laughs> but you still had to work the soil to plant the annuals. There's still trimming of things that needed to be done. It was going to give him purpose. It was going to give him a way in perfection to serve his Savior God who had put him there. And that's the perspective in a fallen world that we can still have. That work is an opportunity to be able to serve our Savior God. Granted, I've been mostly talking in the context of work that you get paid for, but finally work is things that you can volunteer for, work at home or outside the home. There are all kinds of aspects of work, aren't there? But all done to serve our Lord and our Savior God. It was said a long time ago, long time ago, when the great cathedrals were being built in Europe that somebody asked one bricklayer what he was doing. He said, uh, well, I put a brick on top of a brick on top of a brick and put mortar in between and I'm laying brick. They went down the line a little bit and asked another worker, what are you doing? He said, eyes lit up. I'm involved in building this great cathedral to the glory of God. Two people doing the exact same thing. Entirely different perspectives. One saw it as from the hand of God that he was able to offer back to his Lord. The other, I'm just putting brick on top of bricks here. And I got some skill and knowledge to do it. But that's all that I'm doing. God calls us to a different, higher, the highest perspective. That work is done from God's hand in service to that loving hand of our God. Do the words of Psalm 1 make a little bit more sense to you now? When the psalmist wrote about believers, he's like a tree planted by streams of water 
which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. He's not talking about making money. He's talking about a rich, fulfilled life. A satisfied life that a believer can have because it's done to serve the Savior God who has redeemed him and allowed him that privilege of being able to work and serve him through it. Or we're reminded in the New Testament of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord God you are serving. The meaning and function of work, as long as people are trying to find the answer under the sun, there are going to be ongoing questions and ongoing emptiness. Because that's not the answer. We have a perspective. A perspective that is far higher. That we are serving our Savior God. That work is coming from His hand. And whether we are volunteering, whether we are doing things in the family, whether we are doing things to get paid, work done to the Lord is work that does result in lasting satisfaction and fulfillment. Find meaning in your work. Not by manufacturing a perspective, but by living a perspective in Jesus Christ and serving him always. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.